Hello and welcome. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events here at the Mechanics Institute in San Francisco. We'd like to thank you for joining our online program, A Left-Handed Woman Essays with author Judith Thurman, who is in conversation with writer and journalist Julia Flynn Seiler. We're very pleased to welcome Judith back after her jubilant Fetacolette celebration last January. And also we welcome back Julia, longtime friend and member of Mechanics Institute. If you are new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, our ongoing author and literary programs, and on Friday, our cinema lit film series. Please visit us at milibrary.org. Also, if you're here in town, come on Wednesday at noon for a free tour of the Mechanics Institute and our beautiful library and chess club. Our talk today will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience, and we invite you to put your questions in the chat. Also, if you would like to purchase a copy of A Left-Handed Woman Essays, uh, please go to your nearest independent bookstore and purchase your book. A Left-Handed Woman is Judith's first book in 15 years, which gathers together many of her most beloved essays and profiles from The New Yorker, ranging in a variety of topics from fashion, literature, and music to history, gender, and art. Her essays and these gorgeously written portraits capture persona, history, philosophy, time, and place so brilliantly. I'd like to introduce our two guests. Judith Thurman is author of Cleopatra's Nose, 39 Varieties of Desire, Isak Dinesen, the Life of a Storyteller, winner of the 1983 National Book Award for Autobiography, Biography, and Secrets of the Flesh, A Life of Colette, 1999, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Award for Biography, and the Salon Book Award for Biography. Also, the Denison biography served as the basis for Sidney Pollack's movie, Out of Africa, since 2000, she has been a staff writer at The New Yorker, and she's here from the Big Apple. <laughs> and our moderator and host today, Julia Flynn Seiler, is a New York Times bestselling author and journalist. Her most recent book, The White Devil's Daughters, The, Woman, the Women Who Fought Slavery in San Francisco's Chinatown, uh, was uh, published in 2019 and was a New York Times editor's choice and a nonfiction finalist for the California Book Award. Her other books include The House of Mandavi, The Rise and Fall of an American Wine Dynasty, a finalist for the James Beard Award and the Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Reporting, and Lost Kingdom, Hawaii's Last Queen, The Sugar King's and America's first imperial venture adventure. So I'd like to turn this program over to Julia and away we go. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction, Laura. And Judith, this is so fun to talk with you. I know, I want to hear all about your work. I really want to <laughs> well, share it before, with you. Before I actually met you, I fretted a little bit about what to wear because you write so brilliantly about fashion and the New York art scene. And I thought, oh, um, but now that I met you, you're so warm, I didn't worry about it. Oh, that's that. so sweet. That's lovely. Uh, <laughs> no clothes are, I, I semi-retired from writing about fashion. I, uh, I sort of, it's, it's, it's a subject now for which you have to be on social media. You kind of have to follow the, in, very difficult to follow migrations of designers from this place to that place but it's also uh, the fashion world used to be a, a very hierarchical place uh, with um in which uh authority was passed on from down from high to 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 the masses to the consumers and it's not anymore so it's it's uh 
uh, it's very decentralized and it's much sort of harder to, to, um, to understand. Well, I was so fascinated by a statement you made. I think it was maybe to an interviewer that your, uh, your specialty are lost women. And I was wondering if you could tell us what you meant by that. I, yes, that was sort of a theme of my first collection of essays, Cleopatra's Nose. Uh, and and I, I started my career really writing about lost women. How were they lost? They were uh, exceptional artists, writers, who most of them um, who were not English language writers. And so uh, America doesn't translate as many books as it should in translation. In Europe, there's a tremendous amount of translation, especially from the English. Here, that's not so. So I, I, I started writing publishing in Ms. Magazine at the uh, really the very beginning of the, the second wave feminism. And uh, there was an audience ravenous to hear about women's lives. And so I, because I speak, I'm kind of a linguist and I speak three foreign languages, four actually, uh, I could read these women poets and writers in their, in their uh, mother tongues. And that's how I started. So the, the notion of lost women, of bringing, bringing a women back, uh, ignored by history or slighted by history or just forgotten or, or uh, that's sort of how I started. And then as I was thinking and writing about the subject, I realized that it's very deeply personal because my mother was someone she taught English and Latin, but she then she was very depressed and she sort of uh, withdrew from the world in many ways. And I, I I realized that she was lost to herself. And in a way, writing was my ideal as a writer is to give my subjects a reality, to give my subjects a reality, and in some cases a reality that they didn't have for themselves. And that was really directly related to my experience as a daughter. Mm. Would you consider reading us the passages you wrote about uh, your mother, but also your aunts who were extraordinary women? Yes, my mother's sister, my parents died. I had a very late child, only child of 42. My mother, my father died when I was six months pregnant and my mother died when my son was two weeks old. And my old aunt, my mother's sister who had been living with them for the last 15 years of their lives moved to New York to help me take care of my son. And she was what used to be called a spinster. Her, her name was Charlotte, but I called her Archie. And she was so grateful for this uh, reason to be. And, um, and she came to Paris with me when I uh, was writing, doing research for the Colette book. So she really figured in my, in my life. She's my co-parent. I was a single mom. And this is from uh, Judith's beautiful introduction to her collection. So the part she's going to read. Uh, wait, I have to find, I was, I was looking, I had uh, tagged another passage. Let me just find the passage with my aunts. Um, oh, start with your mom. No, no, this, is, this, yeah. is, this, is, this is good. Good. I'm happy to read this. My mother's demons, her abiding terror of some imminent catastrophe still haunt me. By the time I could see her with detachment, she was a sedated recluse who had designated the task of living to her only child. In that sense, our roles were reversed. I attuned my behavior to her fragility. I don't know what her own aspirations might have, might have been, except that she revered language and her gift to me was insisting that I should. During the depression, she taught Latin and English in a Boston high school, but on her wedding day, she forfeited the job. It went to a man, she was told by the principal, who had a family to support. Uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit. Uh, I, I write next about my two maiden aunts. My father also had a quote maiden aunt, who was very important to me. Unlike Eva, who was a, a spinster, who also a spinster, but a woman of the world in many ways, who worked in a bookstore in Harvard Square. Unlike Eva, my maternal aunt Charlotte wasn't a romantic, Though unlike her sister, she inhabited a body that gave her pleasure. Arky, as I called her, was built like an otter and could swim two miles in the ocean. She taught me to ride a bike and to build a campfire. She had spent her youth as an activist in the settlement house movement. Later, she ran a state employment bureau staffed mostly by closeted socialists like herself. Arky took a dim view of patriarchal institutions, religion, capitalism, marriage. She liked to quote one of her professors at a woman's college. He has got to be a very good husband to be better than no husband at all. 
Both my aunts got stuck caring for their elderly parents well into middle age, but then they moved into their own bachelor digs not far apart in Cambridge. They often traveled together adventurously. Had they been born in a later era, they might have been lesbians, and perhaps they were covertly. I hoped so, though we never spoke of intimate things. Of course she was a lesbian, Alison Bechtel said to me of Archie. I was visiting her in Vermont, reporting the profile in this volume. Straight women didn't dress up as Jean Autry. He was a singing cowboy of the 1950s. When I stayed with my grandparents, as I did every summer, Archie sang me to sleep in a Stetson chaps and a six shooter. Oh, what a character, Archie. And here's to here's to all of our feisty aunts who yes. have helped us along. Um, thank you so much. That was just great. And let's start. We're going to talk about about four of your essays. There's so many. It was very hard to choose which ones to discuss because they're extraordinary. But let's start with the woman, the lost woman who made Jackie uh, Kennedy's wedding dress. Her name was Anne Lowe. Could you tell yeah. her, uh, tell us a little bit about her? Well, I had never heard, of, despite my years covering fashion, this is a, this is a story about racism. Despite my years covering fashion, I had never heard of Anne Lowe, even though she was a, um, a very eminent couturier for uh, Americans, the highest American society, the, the Mrs. Vanderbilt's 400 and for um, and Jacqueline Kennedy's stepmother, um, Janet Alkenclaus. She designed Jackie's and Lee's debutante dresses. And when it came time for Jackie to get married, uh, her mother wanted Anne Lowe to design the dress. Um, this is this is uh, Mrs. Lowe and some of her work. I heard about her through a realtor on, during the pandemic, I rented a shack in the Hamptons to try to just get away and work and, and be near the sea. And um, the, the realtor's mother had, had helped Anne Lowe out in one of her frequent periods of financial distress. Uh, she was a, a, a genius who, was born, um, was the, the granddaughter of an enslaved woman um, in Alabama. And her mother and grandmother had been successful uh, dressmakers in Birmingham for the, uh, uh, for the sort of governor's wife and various other society ladies there. And she, uh, she started out her career uh, helping, helping, she learned her trade from her, her mother and her grandmother. And she, um, she made her way in the world with it was Jim Crow South and she had a, uh, she was married and she had a son and they, they lived and they moved to Florida to work for very wealthy, uh, that white family, of course, who owned um, uh, a sugar plantation. So they, 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 they recognized the society of the Florida society recognized her talents, but all along she was, she knew, she knew her worth. She knew that she had some, was something special. Uh, she eventually moved to New York and always with financial difficulties, um, had a quite brilliant career there. But she was exploited by these um, ladies who uh, proudly wore her clothes. In some case, she received notice for the clothes in newspapers. Um, and she would <clears throat> she would die really <clears throat> nearly destitute uh, at a very old age. She, her age is uncertain because she she sort of she was a great storyteller, including about herself. So it's not clear when she was when she was really born, but she embroidered the truth a bit, didn't she? Yeah, she embroidered the truth. But it was extremely difficult to establish the facts of her biography. That's another aspect of American racism, because there were very few public records about um, Black Americans in the South, maybe not even a birth certificate or divorce certificate. It was really only the census that you could draw upon. And it was um, sort of a shocking, a shocking gap, a sort of a shocking void. Uh, and then I, I sort of did very deep dives into the archives of um, black owned newspapers in New York around the, in the, in the years of her, of her work in, in the city. And I found sort of wonderful and illuminating articles that, that even though she was written about by, 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 by fashion magazines and um, uh, in her later years, the black press was very important and she uh, was revered in that. So it was, it was hard to find and establish 
Um, and she didn't, she, there were a few letters, including an, an indignant letter to Mrs. Kennedy that was in the Kennedy Library. Uh, That's very poignant. Was, she had, yes, yeah, she had been described. Someone asked Mrs. Kennedy about her wedding dress and she said, oh, it was made by a colored dressmaker. And Anne Lowe was deeply hurt by that reference. And she- um, Of course, uh, because if she had used her name, the commercial yes, she, potential of that it, would have been exactly. enormous to it her. Been what been an easy normal. gift. What an easy gift. And I, one thinks that Mrs. Kennedy tried to make up for it later by paying her debts at a, at a very difficult moment, but that's, but she, if, if she did so, and she probably did, it was done anonymously. So Anne, Anne Lowe, in a way, it's a, it's, it was an exceptionally moving story for me. And it's written in a, in, in a way, in a more spare, straightforward way than some of my other pieces. And, um, and I met, I found some family members, surviving family members of hers, and they were, they were thrilled that, that she was finally getting uh, some notice, and especially in the New Yorker, and, and we're trying to have a plaque, uh, the historic site here, installed on her building in Harlem. Oh, that's marvelous. I was so moved by that story and also very um, taken by your diligent efforts to find this lost woman and recreate your life to the extent that you could. It really was a marvelous piece of scholarship as well as writing. She's really a lost woman. She's the lostest, I the think. Lostest. The lostest. Well, not entirely. You brought her back. Oh, yeah. A bit, yeah. So. Then there was a lot of, there was, there was, um, uh, uh, some attention that was paid afterwards. Yeah. Now, another woman that captivated my imagination uh, was uh, Lee Miller, and she was a, a model. She started off as an American model, and then a photographer, and then a war correspondent. And you write about her in Roving Eye. And in that story, you say that you suggest that quote, beauty can also be a form of camouflage, one that successfully deceives the beholder without offering much protection to the wearer. And this is probably the image that most people associate with Lee Miller um, to the extent that she hasn't been forgotten. And this is this extraordinary photograph of her in Hitler's bathtub shortly after um, troops and war correspondents were able to get into the inner sanctum. And I was just wondering, Judith, could you, I mean, there's an extraordinary story about of, of hurt behind the beauty. And I was wondering if you could tell us about Lee Miller's Yes, it, it's, hurt. Uh, the beauty is camouflaged. When Lee Miller was, she, Lee Miller was spectacularly beautiful. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, she she experienced the power of that beauty, and she experienced the vulnerability of it. Since since people couldn't see past the beauty to the woman, and neither could she in some ways. Uh, she um, was abused as a little girl, probably by a family friend. It was never determined who had who had sexual. She was sexually abused, and and the trauma was needless to say not dealt with. Uh, her parents were her father was in sort of an eccentric. Uh, he also is a very dubious character who was obsessed with photographing her and did so in ways that would now be considered extremely inappropriate and and um, and borderline abusive. So, but she was also a wild, a woman of tremendous libido and drive and curiosity and adventurousness. She was kind of a bad girl in the old sense of that that world. And she uh, she wanted a life of adventure and she really made one for herself. She um, moved to Europe and she became, she introduced herself to Man Ray at a great photographer at a, at a cafe and announced to him that she was, he, she was his new student, to which he said, I don't accept students. And they left the next day on a car trip to the south of France and were together for years thereafter. Uh, and as Man Ray's apprentice and student and, and lab assistant and, and gopher, she did master the art of, she was a very important and original modernist photographer. Uh, but the, the, her beauty was such that it was easy to sensationalize. And that's what that photograph does. It was taken by, she was a war, she was covering the war, oddly for British Vogue, because she, she had a very, she had a bad drinking problem. And so she was unreliable and people didn't want to hire her. But they saw her pictures of the Blitz her striking pictures of the Blitz, and they said, "Okay, if you want to go, go to the front, go." And, and her pictures from 
um, from the front in Europe were, were extraordinary. And it it was that picture was taken by her friend and colleague and lover. She she pretty much made lovers of of um, many of the men she worked with and encountered, and and people were falling over head over heels in love with her all the time. But it it rather than it, it's it 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 objectifies her, I think, in um, in a way that does her a great disservice. Uh, and and probably and it sensationalizes uh, the the risking of her life and the endurance of danger and the political um, the the anti Nazi uh, fervor of 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 that work. Mm -hmm. Her courage her and courage. her professional accomplishments as yeah. a, as a photographer. You wrote this piece, I, as I recall, in uh, because there was a retrospective of Lee Miller's work. Yes, York. there was a big retrospective in England. And uh, and and by chance, on the way to the show at the Victor at, was at the Victorian Albert Museum, um, there was a show of camouflage nearby in another another venue, and um, and and Lee, there's there's another famous picture of Lee Miller. Uh, her her partner at the time was developing camouflage for the British Army and wanted to try it out, and so Lee Miller pose nude under a netting, camouflage netting on the lawn of their country house. So she lent herself, you know, consent, she consented, she lent herself to um to the to 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 uh the the male gaze, I think is a it's a, a, a good way to put it. Um and and that's where the notion of beauty is camouflage also kind of struck me. Mm, I wish we had this that photograph to share right now. <laughs> but uh, it was one yeah. breast sticking out of the netting, and she was covered with leaves, and yeah, yeah. And how, how like did her body? Ooh, and how did her life end? Well, her um, she she um, years of alcoholism, of course, took a terrible toll. Uh, her marriage. Her husband stayed with her, but was very unfaithful. And and um, at the end of her life, she she became a chef. Uh, she 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 got fat and sort of didn't care. And uh, uh, and she had a, a country house that was a, a, a sort of a bohemian bohemian grove for all kinds of visitors. Uh, and she at the end of her life, she became Lady Penrose, who's her husband. Um, well, and Penrose was was knighted, um, and. Um, one important thing to say is that she had an, an affair with Picasso uh, who painted her and who really left, I think, the most telling image of her uh, that there is in its, um, its still life. And it's a golden face with green hair and a pert profile. I'm reading from the, from the description. An inverted eyeball leaking a tear and caged by red lips, lids. A blue earlobe with a corkscrew earring, a clenched fist, teeth bared in a smile or a grimace, bulging shoulders, white globes with a brown crust, each bigger than the head, which might be the breasts displaced or a bursting heart. So I think that's um, kind of a good, a good way to describe the end of her life. Mm. Mm. Oh, thanks for sharing that with us. Now, uh, a, a profile subject that I'm guessing a, many people in the Bay Area may be familiar with because of a recent show at the Palace of the Legion of, uh, of Honor is of the Chinese designer Guo Pei. And you describe her as she, she's uh, extraordinary and probably best known for uh, designing the brilliantly yellow gown that uh, Rihanna wore to a recent Met Gala. There it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyways, in, in your wonderful essay uh, called The Emperor, Empire's New Clothes, um, you describe her, the designer, as having two sides, Guo, Guo A and Guo B. What do you mean by that? What are those two sides of this Chinese designer? Well, she, um, Guo Pei was always in love with the movies. Uh, and in China, the most popular genre is these historical epics in which there's usually um, uh, a poor girl or a slighted princess who's 
who said it, it, it's it's a, some version of succession, not that this is succession, but some some you know version of a fairy tale in which she has to fight off the enemies and the jealous wives and concubines of the prince. And um, and she uh, she got her start designing fabulous costumes for these for these films. And she's a storyteller with she in, in essence. Uh, as a costumer for, for the movies, you, be, you become a storyteller and the costumes are actually characters in these epics. Uh, but, you know, you, they, it's not very well paid. And she, uh, so on the one hand, she uh, makes her money uh, designing um, beautiful couture for Chinese oligarchs and new, the new, newly rich class of Chinese um, business people and, and some of them self-made women but many of them the wives of, of, of rich men. And she her runway shows and her the runway is really her theater. So those are the those are really the two sides of uh Bope. That's excellent. I mean, it, it was very clear in the show that was in San Francisco, those two sides. Um and it, you would described it so beautifully, you know, the oligarchs versus the theater and uh and thank you for that. And she it, certainly is not a lost woman these days, is she? She's totally very, very woman. prominent. Yeah, very prominent, and she's successful. She joined the the Syndicat de la de la Couture in, in France and shows shows in, in Paris. Shows at the Couture uh, the Couture collection. She um, so the first Chinese woman to be invited into this very elite group. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Yes. She. She is. Yes. That's not true. Actually, there was a, there's a. Oh, a wonderful, interesting, the opposite of Gopé from the point of view of design, a woman named Ma Ke, who uh, dress, has dressed uh, China's first lady, but who's, um, who's takes her inspiration from the proletarian in a way, oh. in a way, sort of in a way that Ray Kawakubo or Kambi Garçon takes her inspiration from Japanese work wear and fishermen's wear and farmers wear. Ma Ke does too. And, and for, for Gopé, her inspiration uh, is the old imperial past and the Chinese court and the tradition of artisanship and embroidery and China, uh, China meaning the porcelain. Uh, so they are, uh, they are poles apart, but I, I haven't seen much work, new work of Maku. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd like to see uh, the work of Maku. I thought, I thought of yeah. maybe pursuing that, but they, the New Yorker doesn't like to send you on trips as long as China, you know, especially um, mm -hmm. these days, so. Well, I, I also love that piece so much because I'd seen that show and then I had this overwhelming question that was not answered by the catalog or any of the copy, which is how in the world could this possibly pencil out this fine way or who is financing, you know, this extraordinary work that she's doing and, and your piece beautifully explains it. So it's a you. great Thank system. So her husband, her husband, who's her manager and her, uh, he was a rich, he is uh, a rich, um, textile manufacturer from Taiwan. Uh, and he, when China opened up um, the, the sort of ca Chinese capitalism, socialist, socialist capitalism uh, era began, he went to China looking for um, talent and he found her. And so he, he, he funded her, her business initially. And then he said, you know, Chinese people aren't reliable. You, you, you make something for them that you, you have to then they don't always pay you so they have a club and you it's a, on a yearly basis as, as are most clubs there's a membership fee and then you have to according to the tiers of membership you pay fifty thousand a hundred thousand two hundred thousand a million dollars a year for a certain number and quality of of her of of, of her couture jaw dropping jaw dropping is, is there any is there anything similar in europe a, a club in that in that sense? I don't believe. I think it's uh, no. I don't think there's anything in the West. It's uh, um, I, I think it's probably easier to um, the couture houses know their clients and they know that they're they're if you if you uh, order something they I think they have much more confidence that they'll actually be paid. You'll pay them, <laughs> of course, of course. So let's let's uh, let's move on to the continent, and let's. Uh, most of us are familiar with the Milanese uh, designer Prada, which uh, I'm not very well versed in fashion, and so I had always thought Prada was uh, someone who designed for 
aristocrats or the upper class or for, but in fact, what I learned in reading your uh, essay, which is titled Radical Chic, um, Prada herself was a communist uh, in her past. And uh, you talk about radical chic and also ugly chic in connection with her work. The idea that, you know, women dress to please themselves, you know, with their tongues for firmly in their cheeks um, a bit. And that's that's her genius to, to express that. Um, so I was wondering if you talk about Prada a little bit. Well, she's, she's, um, she's kind of an intellectual. She was a uh... First of all, communist. Um, it, there's, okay. you know, this is a woman worth about $4 billion, maybe 10, I don't know. But it's a, a one, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, 10, 11. It's like a 12, she's a 12 figure fortune, 12 digit fortune, at least. Um, and and in, of course, in the 70s, when she was young and in university, uh, uh, the students were just routinely left wing. They were, they had revolutionary fervor. However, they lived themselves where their parents lived, whatever country houses they escaped to, they were on the side of the revolution. And so supposedly she, you know, marched in protests in her, um, she, people said that she wore couture clothes to the protest, but she didn't because she loved thrifting. She loved uh, putting together outfits from thrift stores and uh, and she sort of did it brilliantly. So there, there are, again, these, this quote pay one and two, and there's mutual one and two. And uh, mutual one is the child of the um, uh, the old bourgeoisie of Milan, unbelievably conservative uh, mm-hmm. class of people, um, uh, with very well regulated gender assignments, uh, including sartorial gender assignments, and she takes and so she she takes those conventions, the little cardigan and the pleated skirt, and um, the little black dress, and she, uh, she, she sort of adds a radical or subvert. She subverts them. It's really subvert. It's not. It's not. She doesn't. She doesn't. Um, she doesn't vandalize them. Some some couturiers think Ray Kawakubo is something of a vandal, but she subverts them. And her clothes are also uh, there's there's an edge of malice to her clothes. If you, which is is interesting. It's a challenge. They are often, they can be extremely unflattering. You can look like uh, a governess in them, an old fashioned prim governess with a bun and you know, little buttoned up things. So what she's challenging women to do is to bring their own subversive energy, their own um, impishness or their own uh, rebelliousness uh, as she has brought hers to the wearing of these clothes. And you never really know what a product uh, dress or suit or is going to look like until you're in the dressing room. She she sizes her clothes low, so you have to get a size larger than you would like to see. And it's it's an interesting dance. Uh, and she it's she's been she's also understood the, the, the one of the greatest successes in fashion history is the is the Prada backpack, this light nylon backpack that you can that doesn't that doesn't um that gives you great freedom of, of movement. You can carry it, you know, everywhere you can stuff it full of, of, of your, your, your high heels and wear your walking shoes to get around with. So she's, uh, she's also, um, she's, she's sort of also understood that about, about uh, design. And, um, and for me, the great designers, the people I really am interested in writing about are the ones who really try to imagine a woman's real life. And she, she does mm-hmm. do that. I love that. Do you wear Prada? You know, I I I have certain yes. I I buy all my clothes in thrift stores and resale stores. But I told this to a to an interviewer. Sister, and, you're a sister to me. I do the same thing. <laughs> just exactly. I just and and now online there are these wonderful sites online. But for my 75th birthday, I walked past the Prada store on Madison Avenue, and in the window was the dress of my dreams. And um, I walked in and I went upstairs and I tried on the dress and the salesperson said, well, it needs to be taken in. Shall I call the tailor? I said, yes. I pinned, I hadn't asked the price. They pinned it. And I thought you're gonna, you're gonna go through with this now. And so I went up to the cash register and I gave them my credit card like this. <laughs> so that's my product dress. 
<laughs> well, you have to tell us what it looked like, though. You haven't described a, the dress to us. It's a beautiful black sort of, uh, it's it's um, sheer, but there's a slip under it, and it has long, and it's pleated in the back so that it flows, and it has a placket, a, a, a woolen knitted placket that goes all the way down the front and and, um, and uh, mother of pearl buttons. Oh, it sounds beautiful. It's really great. I'm glad you got it. You can wear it over jeans. You can wear it over <laughs> trousers. You can wear it. You can you can subvert it. As, uh -huh. It was all great product. It was all the best product stuff. Lovely, lovely. Now, your piece on Paleolithic art, it's titled First Impressions, is so wonderful, kind of like shopping and finding your dream dress. In, in that <laughs> essay, we get to follow your adventures into caves and to this extraordinary place. Um, would you please read to us from the beginning of that essay? And this image is from uh, from one of the caves that you Yes, made. it's from Chauvet. It's from the, it, it, they, they've just made some discoveries of slightly older uh, parietal art, um, but this was the oldest for, this was the oldest discovered cave for a very long time. It's 35,000 years old, 37 maybe. Um, I just want to say before I, I read this, it was one of the great, gifts to me of, of from the New Yorker of this assignment because I got to I got to uh, go into not to Chauvet but into the cave at Neo. I got to experience cave art firsthand. I got to live with the researchers uh, in their camp and um, and I got to in a way to consort with our our ancestors, the the artists who who painted this. Um, during the Old Stone Age, between 37,000 and 11,000 years ago, some of the most remarkable art ever conceived was etched or painted on the walls of caves in southern France and northern Spain. After a visit to Lascaux in the Dordogne, which was discovered in 1940, Picasso reportedly said to his guide, they've invented everything. What those first artists invented was a language of signs, for which there will never be a Rosetta Stone, perspective, a technique that was not rediscovered until the Athenian Golden Age, and a bestiary of such vitality and finesse that by the flicker of torchlight, the animals seemed to surge from the walls and move across them like figures in a magic lantern show. In that sense, the artists invented animation. They also thought up the grease lamp, a lump of fat, with a plant wick placed in a hollow stone to light their workplace, scaffolds to reach high places, the principles of stenciling and pointillism, powdered colors, brushes, and stumping cloths, and more to the point of Picasso's insight, the very concept of an image. A true artist reimagines that concept with every blank canvas, but not from a void. So if you think about 37,000 years ago, uh, we take for granted, we sort of take the notion of art and representation for granted, but it began somewhere and that's where it began. Extraordinary. Wow. I just love that essay. It was, it was really, really beautiful. I was and proud of it. I, I, it meant so much to me. The, the, the Paleolithic artist meant so much to me. The scientist meant so much to me. And, uh, the um, and I was I couldn't go into Chauvet. It's off limits to anybody but the but the scientists. And then they could only be there two or three at a time, and for one week a year. But as a sort of consolation prize, the they sent me to another cave, vast, wonderful cave, where very small groups with guided can can enter it. And I was there alone with my guide, uh, and um, I, I just wanted to read the end of it because uh, it that was a. It, it almost, I, I knew I had to describe it, but it was an almost indescribable um, experience. Um, every encounter with the cave animal takes it and you by surprise. Your light has to rouse it and your eye has to recognize it because you tend to see creatures that aren't there while missing ones that are. Halfway home to the mortal world, I asked aloud, he was my guide, if we could pause and turn off our, our flashlights. The acoustics magnify every sound and it takes the brain a few minutes to accept the totality of the darkness. Your sight keeps grasping for a hold. Whatever the art means, 
you understand at that moment that its vessel is both a womb and a sepulcher. Mm. So that I did, I did, that was my great revelation. Mm. And what a, what, a, what a deep one. Beautiful. Now, you, you ended the collection with uh, the essay Asylum Seeker, and you wrote that during the pandemic. I would wonder if you could read to us from the beginning of that. Yes, this, this um, reading Dante during the pandemic was a blessing. It was uh, 50 years ago. I was, a, I'll, I'll tell you at the end who the guest is when I, when I finish it. 50 years ago, I was a guest at the baptism of a friend's son in the ancient church of a Tuscan hamlet. It was Easter and lambing season. A Sardinian shepherd who tended the flocks of a local landowner came to pay his respects to the new parents. He was a wild looking man with matted hair whose harsh dialect was hard to understand. Among our party was a beauty of 15, an artist's daughter and the shepherd took such a fancy to her that he asked for her hand. The girl's father politely declined and the shepherd to show that he had no hard feelings offered us a lamb for our Paschal dinner. My friends were penniless bohemians so the gift was welcome. It came, however, with a condition. We had to watch the lamb being slaughtered. The blood sacrifice took place after the baptism. That morning, the baby's godfather, an expatriate writer, had caused a stir in the church, since none of the villagers, most of them farmers, had ever seen a black man in person. Some tried to touch his hands to see if the color would rub off. There was a sense of awe among them, as if one of the magi had come to visit. Towards the end of the ceremony, the moment came for the sponsors to renounce Satan and all his seductions of sin and evil. The godfather had been raised in a pious community and he entered the spirit of this one. His own experience of malevolence had taught him as he wrote that life is, quote, not moral. Yet he stood gravely at the font and vowed, renuncio. I thought of those scenes last spring when I began reading three new translations of Purgatory being published to coincide with the 700th anniversary of Dante's death at 56 in September of 1321. The speech of the Hamlet had primed my ear with the poet's tongue. Di che potenza vieni? An old farmer had asked the godfather, from what power dost thou come? Purgatory, like the other two canticles of what Dante called his sacred epic, Inferno and Paradise, takes place during Easter week in 1300. In Canto I, the pilgrim and his Ciceroni Virgil emerge from hell and arrive at the mountain of, quote, that second kingdom where the human spirit purges itself to become worthy of heaven. Dante's body still clad in its flesh inspires marvel among the shades because it casts a shadow. They mob him with questions. From where has he come? So, that, the Godfather. <laughs> the Godfather was James Baldwin, and at the at the very end of the piece, I come back, and without saying that James Baldwin was the Godfather in the first paragraph, um, I um, I'm talking about purgatory uh, and the necessity to become conscious, to take responsibility for, and to become conscious of your sins as a way of be, before you can expiate them. Uh, and and uh, and I, it's a wonderful Baldwin quote: "People who shut their eyes to reality simply invite their own destruction, and anyone who insists on remaining in a state of innocence long after that innocence is dead turns himself into a monster." And in a way, uh, that's so much of what Dante is um, uh, Dante is writing about. And I, the the great insight for me of this piece was that in Dante, Dante is understood that. Every sin is a sin against love. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, love of others, love of self, love of the environment, love of the planet, love of nature, uh, love of love. So um, it was during the pandemic uh, when we were so aware, both of our connection and our disconnection from other human beings, mm -hmm. uh, reading Dante was a real blessing. Judith, were you in uh, Manhattan during the pandemic? I was in this room. <laughs> uh, oh. No, actually, I had a terrible flood in the house uh, in July of 2020. And so I was 
I, I moved around to friends' apartments when the when was the work was being done to patch it up. But I was in New York the whole time. Yeah. So it you were hearing the ambulances and all seeing the, time, the uh, images yeah. and working on this essay about Dante. And walking every day in the park, because you, you know, that was I would walk through the park and at one point there was a, a field hospital uh in Central Park uh, across the across Fifth Avenue from Mount Sinai. It was it was hallucin was sort of hallucinatory. These the, 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 uh, my route, you know, went past Lenox Hill, past Mount Sinai. There was there were um uh refrigerator trucks outside of the hospitals for the bodies. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was ground zero. something. Do you think the pandemic has permanently changed your city? I mean, you're a lifelong New Yorker. I've been in New York for a very long time. I'm, I'm a born New Yorker. Uh, yes and no. I think it depends on your age. I think the young people, my my stepchildren and my the, my godchildren and the children of my friends, they're back to their lives. They're back to their pre-pandemic lives. I think those of us who are old and 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 we were sort of bludgeoned with the notion of our mortality. And I think that fragility is is um, that fragility lives on. There's still all of these out nice outdoor, you know, sort of extensions of New York restaurants that sort of enliven the street scene. I think they'll be with us for a while. Uh, and I think everybody is uh, conscious of and grateful to the um, the frontline workers of every description. Uh, who risk their lives every day. But the mortality rate here was really, really terrifying. I see uh, Laura is here. Laura, did you ha have a question or should we yes. kick off questions at yeah, this point? Yeah, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful, inspiring conversation. And I, I want to jump off from Dante because um, what I understand, Judith, is that you also began your earlier career as a poet and that your publisher had met you as a poet. And I'd, yeah. I'd like to know about your writing at that time and the style of work and if you have anything offhand that you'd like to read for Sorry. us. And also to talk about some of your uh, favorite poets or poems. That have well, I, I, that's so sweet of you to, to even bring, I did start life as a poet. I supported, I was living in England. I supported myself as a private chef uh, for a painter and his wife and uh, worked at the Poetry Society. And I was, um, I was, I, I was very, I was reading women poets. I was reading Sylvia Plath and Adrienne Rich. And, and then I discovered, uh, and Sappho and uh, Emily Dickinson, my great, whom I've written about numerous times now. Uh, so they were terrific influences, and Louise Glick, and uh, who won the Nobel Prize recently. Uh, so um, those were some of my early influences, and I don't have I don't have the book of poems handy, but um, I, and I translated Louise Labbe, the great French seventeenth sixteenth uh, century poet, and and Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, a Mexican nun, great woman, a great great poet. I began my career as a translator of poetry, women's women's poetry. Mm -hmm. Those those translations were in the Penguin Book of Women Poets. So I was I, I and I, I did the translations of Dante, except for a couple in the piece on Dante, because there's so many translations and to identify them. And I loved doing that. I loved I loved that 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 part of the work. Have you done any translation of any of the Italian uh, Renaissance? Perhaps Renaissance poets, Gustav, um, Stampa. We can't forget her. Gaspar, Gaspar Stampa. Gaspar no, Stampa. Yeah. Gaspar Stampa. I should translate yeah. Gaspar Stampa. Yes. And, and of course, you know, sort of reading and writing about Elena Ferrante was also, uh, um, and reading her in Italian was sort of eye opening too. Yeah. I, I just opened your book to that exact chapter, which is one I'm gonna, the one I'm going to read next <laughs> for the Ferrante one. I also have a question about because you know you've had one experience, at least from what I know, on on the Isaac Denison film. Um, you know, of your many essays, do you see any of your other essays and featured persona as a film? I mean, what would what would be your choice to have a film made? Of an essay or of well, character as, per, of a as person it, featured. As it happens, Werner Herzog bought the film rights to First Impressions and made 
a wonderful documentary, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. I was supposed to go back to France with him, but I got sick. I had got very sick and I couldn't travel when he was making the film. So I missed that shoot. And I and I and I told Werner, I said, you have to take someone who speaks French because they all think they speak English really well enough, but you're going to get so much such a richer account if you're if they're in speaking in their own language. He didn't listen to me, but the, it was a wonderful uh, documentary anyway. And we have we now have that precious record of Chauvet because I think in time they're not going to let anybody else back in to certainly not to films. So that was um, that was kind of great. Uh, I think Anne Lowe's life would be a wonderful film. Mm -hmm. I really wish somebody would would do that, and I wish somebody would write her biography. There's a, a young um, fashion historian uh, who I worked with on on the piece, and maybe she will. She's she's uh, she's interested in it, so maybe that will happen. Great. Also, um, what I'd love to hear what both of you are reading now for your inspiration. Why don't you go, Julie? Oh, well, I have, uh, I have been reading a lot of uh, nonfiction uh, by California authors over the last few months um, for the California Book Awards and my head is spinning with them, but I am a huge fan of Adam Hulk Shields' work, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. who's the Berkeley-based writer, and he writes occasionally for The New Yorker. Uh, I, I think, like you, Judith, he's just got, he's a master stylist. He's, he's a, a wonderful writer. writer. He's a yeah. wonderful, he's done some very important historical Sorry, you, Who was that? Adam, Adam Hulk Shield. Shield. Oh, Adam, of Adam Hulk Hulk Shield we, from uh, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. we, we know him well, and he's come on programs many times, and, and also Arlie as well yes. so you know we're we're very fond of them i speaking of california writers i got my first fan letter the one that still thrills me the most from lawrence ferlinghetti <laughs> it, was, it was for the denison piece in Miz in 1974 i think i remember and lawrence and i couldn't believe it i thought someone was was playing a prank but it was from the station it was this bookstore stationery and he wrote to say how much he'd like that piece so, you know, he was he was also the beats. I love the beats. I was sort of uh, too young to be one, but I, I love them. And um, I'm, I'm doing a profile for The New Yorker on Emily Wilson, the translator of Homer. She published her translation of the Odyssey a few years ago and her Iliad comes out in the fall. So that's that's what I've been reading. And once you start, you know, first of all, you have to read every word of the Iliad, which is a thousand pages. And then I read the Odyssey, her Odyssey before and then her other books on Seneca and on on death and and um, and all around the subject of of uh, of of translation and and so that's what I'm up to. Right, I noticed that in the catalogs. You know, maybe we're going to try to to get Emily for a program, and maybe you could interview her. Yep, that would be great. That Let's would be great. <laughs> that would be great. She's basically. Right. Yeah. I'll pursue that. Um. Also, um, what are your next projects that you're working on? Julie. Well, uh, I'm working on a, what I hope will be a book about um, an Arctic uh, explorer, kind of a lost woman um, in the 20th century. And uh, I spent about, you know, I've, I've, I've been digging through the archives and having some good adventures, trying to track her down and the traces of her life. And, so fingers crossed. Uh, fingers crossed. That come. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'll do after Emily Wilson. There is a bunch of, there's a lot of a choice. Uh, there's another story about caves. There's a story about the oldest story. I sort of am staying with the far, the distant past. That sort of, I seem to be, the, 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 the immediate present is so distressing for all kinds of reasons that the distant past is sort of becoming my refuge. But I'm going to where the, I, the, the clear, a left-handed woman won the pen prize for the art of the essay, and I'm going to be wearing my Prada dress to the uh, pen gala. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah, so I'm very happy about having it because I don't have to worry now. Great. When is that coming up? Uh, soon. Weekend. Very Next soon. Next weekend, the 13th or 14th. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Oh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Well, oh, there's so we'll, many. Be, we'll be cheering you on. Yes. Are there any other questions from our audience out there? 
Uh, Julia, any other questions for Judith that you'd like to mm. share? Mm. Well, the Met Gala, Judith, did you go and or any thoughts? I've never been invited. Even the year I wrote the catalog essay for the really yeah no um and um that's, that's I was very annoyed because I had to go to my book club that night across the park and it was it was closed everything was closed down as if for the St. Patrick's Day parade uh and I, I wrote about there's a piece about Lagerfeld in the book it's an obituary uh, for Lagerfeld I think he was an extraordinary virtu vir virtuoso but he wasn't he to me he wasn't one of those couturiers or designers who really tries to rethink women's experience. So he doesn't interest me as much as Chanel does or, or Mucha or uh, Enlo doesn't think, Enlo was, she was, it, she didn't have the freedom, her economic and the, you know, the, the racism and the economy of her life and the, the lack of you know, her privileges that she had to endure didn't really give her the kind of freedom to rethink what it means to be a woman. She was also working for white women. She wasn't um, she did have a couple of, of black clients, but 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 um, she's exceptional in all kinds of ways. But but yeah, so fine. It's it's um, it's sort of Mardi Gras. It's a one day New York Mardi Gras. The, the <laughs> Met Gala. We do have one question in the chat. Why is the book called A Left Handed Woman? It's true. We never talked about that. I'm left handed. I'll, I'll read you the first sentence just quickly of the introduction tells you why. Um, I write with my left hand. Left-handedness used to be considered a malign aberration. Sinister is Latin for left. Uh, and then I go on to say how children were routinely changed. And I also go on to talk about left-handedness as a predicament that you don't have to be left-handed to uh, experience, which is that there's something not right with you. Uh, and I, I, I take that um, notion and I examine how it relates to my subjects uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a world in which women were, um, were deprived of self-expression. So uh, that's why. Also, this is a, this is, this is a, a, a woman's left hand. It was a, a drawing that a very dear friend gave to me, a late, a late 18th century English drawing. And it, was, it's, it has been sitting on opposite my writing desk for many years and suddenly I looked up and I thought, oh, a left hand, a left-handed woman. So that's how the title came to be. Uh, and also I was taken by what, what your mother said. Don't, don't say that you're left-handed or anything about and left because being a lefty in that era and... <laughs> I went to kindergarten. My mother said, don't tell anybody you're a lefty. I had no idea what she, I was five years old. It was the height of the McCarthy era. And I, she couldn't explain. So, uh, so yeah, but that stuck with me. It stuck with me that there was something you could reveal about yourself that would be, would be, uh, would cause you trouble and cause your family trouble and, and be looked upon as shameful. Well, I want to thank Judith Thurman and Julia Flynn Seiler for a wonderful conversation and all that you've revealed of yourselves, yourselves, and also these incredible people uh, in in past history and current history. Uh, and I want to thank you, Laura, and I want to thank the Mechanics Institute for the second wonderful encounter. And I really want to thank Jul Julia, who says that her nickname is Julie, um, to her friends for being a, a, but not just diligent and searching, but such a warm and uh, uh, and curious, uh, generous interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, audience out there. Please join us for our upcoming programs and visit our website. We have events here on site at the Mechanics Institute, 57 Post Street. Come down for a tour on Wednesday, free tour and visit us online for all that we offer. And we will see you very soon. Thank you so much. Oh, that was fun. I think it that went was so fun. well. <laughs> yeah. That was 